Thank you very much, Simon, for the kind introduction. Uh, can I just check? I did, do, I did it last night, and we had five, but how many members of the Stern Review team here? Well, they, they must have... Is it four now? <laughs> we'll find out who dropped out. And, uh, so, but thank you, thank you to all those. They were a fantastic, uh, a fantastic group. Um, and uh, thank you all um, for being around after 10 years. I, I, I would like to remember uh, Dennis Anderson, who helped us so much, a really, really wonderful energy economist who sadly passed away not, lo not very long after the Stern Review, but he, he was a fantastic influence on us all and a great bridge between the technologists and the scientists and the economists, because he was all of those things personally himself. Now, um, it's very uh, uh, also apposite, I think, uh, resonant um, to be back here at the Royal Society. Um, Gordon Brown and Tony Blair st stopped taking big chunks out of each other uh, about a month before the Stone Review was published when Tony said he would be handing over in uh, June 2007. So the warfare, they started, it, it, it moved from taking big chunks out of each other to small chunks out of each other, but actually it was a moment, with, in all due respect and without the levity, it was a moment where uh, the government was looking forward, thinking hard about where to go, and uh, Gordon Brown and Tony Blair came together, um, and D David Miliband was also on the platform with us uh, in his environmental responsibilities. So it was a very thoughtful discussion, and Margaret Beckett uh, also uh, contributed right after, and we had a lot of discussion, because she was Foreign Secretary with the uh, international press. And it was uh, a very big moment, and I wanted to recognize the leadership that Gordon Brown and, and Tony Blair gave in setting this on course and then supporting it afterwards. And indeed, subsequent governments have, uh, have done as well. So it's a very good thing to be back here in uh, the Royal Society where it was, in fact, uh, in fact launched. Now, um, moving to um, the lecture itself, can I just check how many people were here last, not here, in the LSE last night? So less than half. Um, what, what I'll do then, uh, I've got a few slides which are a bridge between last night and today. So those of you who were here last night, those who were at the LSE last night, and who were also listening last night, um, <laughs> don't have to concentrate so hard through this uh, bridge moment, as it were. I'll try not to take too long on it, because uh, what I really want to do today is to look forward to what we do over this next 10 or 20 years and how we do it. Now, it's obviously a global story, so I'll have to be fairly broad brush, but I want also to be quite specific about the uh, analysis of the nature of uh, some of the things that we have to do. So this is the story. So one and two will be a reminder of what this story is all about. And three and four will be the sort of analytical guts of what I have to say, which is what the growth story looks like, how you put policies together to uh, encourage it, because this, this is the new growth story of the future uh, on sustainable development. And then I will uh, say something uh, about the centrality of sustainable infrastructure <coughs> in this whole story and how you go about delivering that and delivering it uh, quickly. And so the last bit, the, sec the fifth section, will be um, reflections on what our chances are of uh, doing all this. So you know basically the story that uh, emissions of greenhouse gases increase the concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere that uh, prevents uh, some more infrared energy from escaping, and that gives you the warming and the climate change, and that threatens um, lives and livelihoods. Uh, over the last 10 years, emissions have gone on upwards. Of course, you don't get concentration stabilized until emissions are net zero. Um, emission is a flow stop process. The stock stops going up when the flow uh, goes to zero. But basically, of course, so while net emissions are positive, you have concentrations going up, but it's worse than that because the flows themselves 
have been going up, and they're uh, um, a good bit higher. Uh, well, when we're doing the stone review, around 41 gigatons, billion tons CO2 equivalent, now more like 50. So uh, in the period, concentrations have been going uh, on upwards. They rise at, at, at very roughly two and a half parts per million per year. And of course, whilst the emissions go on up, that increment uh, will be uh, going up as well. So in action, you know, 100 years or so of doing not very much about the way we organize our economies and societies could take you to 800, 850, maybe more. Uh, and that would be talking about um, temperature increases. Obviously, there's a probability distribution, but you could be talking about temperature increases of four or five degrees centigrade. Um, increases uh, taking to levels of uh, average global surface temperature uh, of a kind we haven't seen for tens of millions of years, bearing in mind that our civilization is really only the Holoc from the Holocene period when we started cultivating and had uh, sedentary. Uh, you have to, if you plant it, you have to wait until the harvest comes. Those of you who've never done any agriculture should be able to work that one out. So uh, you wait, you have uh, villages, you have surpluses, so you have universities as well as societies and British academies. And uh, that's the period, that's the period of our civilization. It's been plus or minus, roughly speaking, one degree centigrade. We're already virtually on the edge of that period, and that's why we see now and describe ourselves as moving into the Anthropocene. That we see strong effects now, in the words of Ronnie Reagan, you ain't seen nothing yet. This is uh, we're two degrees moving up reasonably close, we hope, well below. <laughs> two degrees would still be a lot more in terms of effects, and of course four and five degrees are very hard to imagine in terms of the way in which they would rewrite the relationships between human beings and the planet. Hundreds of millions, probably billions, uh, would have to move as a result of desertification. Some places uh, below sea level, other places uh, battered by severe weather events in other places. Uh, the kinds of uh, uh, climate change that actually move people on a grand scale. Um, we don't have much idea of what four or five degree uh, C would look like with any precision, but I think we can say with great confidence that the, risk, the risks are immense. So that's really what I've just said. We haven't seen this for a very long time, and uh, the potential risks are so large that it would not be sane to go there. And as we'll be arguing, and I did argue yesterday, it would not be sane to go there for another reason, because the alternative path of sustainable development is so much more attractive. You know, cities where you can move and breathe, um, and be uh, productive ecosystems that have some chance uh, of um, survival, um, much more inclusive uh, societies and so on. So this potential is an extremely attractive story. And that understanding is what I emphasized last night, that understanding of the great attraction of the different ways of doing things has been absolutely fundamental and was a key part of getting an agreement in Paris. So yesterday I emphasized very strongly that of the big changes that have taken place in the last 10 years, perhaps the most important one is that understanding, that growing understanding that the alternative growth story is a growth story, it's an inclusive growth story, and it's enormously attractive, and it is, of course, sustainable, whereas the other story is simply not. So that, I think, that was the story I tried to tell last night. So we've learned since the Stern Review that the, including because emissions have gone on rising, but also because the science has been uh, so clear and strong, and increasingly clear and strong, some of the things coming through faster than we thought. We've learned that not only the risks are greater, but also the, what we can do is an enormously attractive um, path for the future. Now, um, it's not just Paris, of course. Paris was an extraordinary event. I'll say a little more about that. But I spoke a bit about it last night. Paris is a very important event, 195 countries getting together in anticipation of a problem. Contrast that with the period at the end of the Second World War, where we had Declaration of Human Rights, Bretton Woods Institutions, UN coming together, beginnings of the EU and so on. That came about after 30 years of two world wars and a Great Depression and blood everywhere, when it had to be clear that um, collaboration was much better than what had gone before. 
Um, it is evolutionary story. You look at something going badly wrong and you think there must be a better way. This was an anticipatory story. Evolution has given us the powers to anticipate, but we use them very heavily in coming to the Paris Agreement. We looked ahead and we saw a problem, and we acted collectively, not with 44 countries and one dominant country, as in Bretton Woods, but 195 countries without one dominant country. That was a very important event. The second, uh, well, preceded it, preceding it, were the Agreement on Sustainable Development Goals in the UN in September 2015. And that was a very important story also. Uh, and uh, I'll say something a bit more about the way in which that whole story of the global agenda through the Sustainable Development Goals, the global agenda through the Paris COP21 Agreement, how they fit together, how they constitute a growth story if done well, with rising standards of living across a full range of development, uh, not just, of course, uh, in material terms, and that that story is a very powerful one, and within it, sustainable infrastructure is absolutely central. Of course, in last year, increasingly, the world is uncomfortable in difficulty uh, around the enduring effects of the global financial crisis. Um, we're you know, coming up for nine years since that crisis, and the growth story is deeply worrying and difficult, and has had all kinds, or the absence of the growth story in many parts of the world, has had all kinds of uh, difficult consequences. And um, so the G20 has been focusing rightly for some time on how to ignite or reignite, I'm not sure about the, the verb and the metaphor, um, you know, we're not gonna burn anything, but how to uh, reignite global uh, growth. And that's a big part of the story together. So there are these three strands, and the kind of story we're looking at today will be driving, should be driving, can drive all those three uh, strands. And it can be a growth story, an inclusive story, and a sustainable story. This is a very urgent um, challenge. Um, delay is extremely dangerous. I'll illustrate that a bit more during the course of the lecture. It's dangerous because of the ratchet effect. The flows go to the concentrations, the contra concentrations rise. It's very difficult to get the CO2 in particular out of the uh, atmosphere, so you have a ratchet effect. You've only got um, a small space in which to move. You can measure that by the amount of emissions that are left in order to be consistent with well below two degrees. You can measure it relative to some notional concentration. But the later you leave it, the smaller that space. So there's, uh, that's a big danger of uh, delay. But there's another one, of course, which is the uh, lock-in of high carbon infrastructure. Uh, if you build high carbon, that lasts for a long time. And that ties you in to future emissions or to uh, costly um, scrapping of that uh, infrastructure. And the very rapid process of urbanization is driving uh, that danger of the lock-in uh, very, uh, very hard. So delay uh, is dangerous. Sometimes in uncertain worlds, delay uh, makes sense while you collect information. This is not such an example for the reasons I just described. Um, I've already uh, pointed out, and I think this is something that's become, it, it should of course always have been clear, that uh, concentrations stop rising when net emissions are zero. I mean, that's a, a very simple uh, observation, analyti <coughs> analytical observation. But it's become more and more important in the discussion because we know that if we stabilized, God forbid, at five degrees centigrade, we'd still have to have net zero emissions. You don't stabilize until you've got net zero emissions. Otherwise, uh, concentrations and temperatures go on uh, rising. So the discussion now is when do you have to go to net zero emissions for a particular temperature target? Um, we don't know exactly, of course. There's lots of uncertainty here, but you can uh, give a rough idea. Probably 2070, 2080, we're well below two degrees. Uh, we don't know exactly. Probably mid-century or earlier for 1.5 degrees. So we have to be thinking very clearly and specifically now about how net zero emissions could happen, because we know that before very long, if we are to stabilize, we've got to 
get there. And that has moved much more to the centre of the analytical and public policy stage. stage. Uh, Paris, uh, well, we are about 50 uh, gigaton CO2 equivalent per annum in terms of emissions, as I, I just indicated. If you look at where the Paris forecast, the so-called uh, intended nationally determined contributions, now nationally determined contributions, they would take us to 55 and upwards in 2030. So that's essentially a 10% increase or more over the next 15 years when most two degree paths, uh, two degree, not well below, but most two degree paths uh, look like uh, 40 um, gigatons or less uh, in 2030. So Paris at the moment gives us a 10% increase over the next 15 years when we should be looking for a two degree path, even more for a well below two degree path, uh, should be looking for a 20% reduction. So that's an indication of why Paris embodied so clearly and strongly the importance of ramping up emissions. So that takes us then to, that's the bridge of between last night. Now, how do we get this sustainable growth that's going to be at the heart of the story of radical change? How do we get it quickly? How do we get it at the pace that we need around the world? Well, sustainable growth requires the right kind of investment, and we have to create the frameworks for that investment. We are beginning to see what it looks like. We can see, for example, decentralized solar uh, enables children to read and study in the evening. It makes you independent from the grid. There are many parts of the world where you don't want to be dependent on the grid because somebody else has got their finger on your switch and they can give you uh, a visitation and ask for uh, some kind of transaction to help you keep their finger off the switch. Uh, decentralized solar is uh, a liberating, empowering story uh, in terms of reliability, but also in terms of uh, what, uh, how people can study at home and so on. Uh, often it's women who organize the, um, the, the, the solar, uh, the batteries into which the solar puts its uh, energy, people come and charge their mobile phones and so on. Um, so it has all kinds of good uh, consequences. This one other, well two other examples, system of root intensification for rice, um, where it's not just rice, it's other crops as well, but it's been particularly strong for rice. You use uh, less water, you save energy, that's good for um, cost, that's good for development. It's more resilient against difficult weather conditions. And of course, if you don't flood the paddy fields, then they don't release the, meat, the methane. Public transport, another example, where um, the kinds of things we're talking about are uh, very good for development and uh, inclusive, give poor people a better chance. Strongly true, of course, in forests and uh, ecosystems. So that's the picture of what we're trying to do. There isn't a problem with savings in the world. There are some who, Ben Bernanke in the past and others, who've talked about the savings glut. I don't buy that one. What we've got is a deficiency of investment demand. And there are tremendous investment opportunities. And uh, the challenge is through good policy to turn all these wonderful opportunities into real projects and real investment demand, and real investment demand of the right kind. This will be about radical change. There will be dislocation, and change has to uh, be, has to be uh, managed. If you're closing down coal mines, you are actually uh, uh, coming to the end of a very uh, dangerous and unpleasant way of earning your living but it is a way of earning your living for many people, so you have to manage your way out of that kind of uh, story, and that's a key part as well. So as we look at the magnitude of change and the nature of change, we also have to think about management of dislocation. So strong investment, strong growth of the right kind requires strong investment of the right kind. Strong investment of the right kind requires clear and credible direction. Now, when I was working as chief economist of the World Bank, and indeed prior to that at the EBRD, um, the ideas we really developed at the EBRD, we made absolutely centre stage the investment climate. And put very crudely, government-induced policy risk is the biggest deterrent to investment worldwide, whether it be in some places a threat of uh, nationalisation, whether it be a dysfunctional port system through the corruption 
in the uh, ports, whether it be governments that switch their policies this way and that way every five minutes. Um, the whole range of sources of government-induced uh, policy risk, whether they have a court structure where you can enforce contracts within a short period of time, as opposed to having Bleak House and Dickens uh, proportions of dealing with uh, dispute resolutions. The, these are the kinds of ways, many ways, in which uh, government-induced policy risk and government-induced risk kill off investment, whether it's uh, you know, brown, blue, pink, or green. And so as we talk about policy, and I'll talk about the specifics of policy very soon, it's important to uh, emphasize very strongly that you need consistency, clarity, and credibility. It was a, there was an earlier rather vulgar version of that, was long, loud, and legal, but I, uh, that's not very good. I prefer consistency, clarity, and credibility of, uh, of policy. But you also have to be, and this is a language I've tried to insist on, predictably flexible. This is a process of fostering change. As change takes place, for example, as you start to bring down the costs of some technologies, as those technologies start to diffuse across the economy, you would expect them to revise your policies as they become, in this case, successful. So you don't need to foster to quite the same strength. That's a subsidy. You don't need the subsidy to quite the same strength as you did uh, before. But you have to be predictably flexible. Uh, what is very dangerous, and we did see this in the UK last year, and in not only the UK, it happened other places as well, you suddenly switch something off without any uh, prior notice and without any real clarity as to the principles governing that decision. You've got to be predictably flexible, set out in advance how that's going to work. So I've spoken about the credibility of, of policy and the principles and the institutions are important in all that. But what about the areas of policy now? Um, well, it did say in the Stern Review that this is the greatest market. Emissions, the externality from the damage of the emissions of greenhouse gases is the greatest market failure the world has ever seen. That's right, because we all do it and we're all affected by it. And it's of enormous proportions. That why, that's why we said <clears throat> the greatest market failure the world has ever seen. Um, the, the, there are some positions that think that everything in the world is efficient, therefore every public policy must be undermining efficiency. I, I'm not there, and I hope very few sane people are there. This is a story of trying to get markets to work as well as we can, where we see market failures, where we see <coughs> markets offering incentives in uh, difficult or damaging directions, Good policy works uh, often, it's not the only way, but good policy works to try to help those markets function better. So greenhouse gases, taxes, cap and trade, regulation, research, development and deployment. It's always true that the publicness of ideas associated with discovery mean that you have a market failure because other people gain knowledge from what you've done. Even if what you've done is a failure, they gain knowledge from what you've done. So we have to think about how to incentivize. That's true of all <clears throat> R&D. It's particularly important here because we all gain from the use of a technology because of the uh, greenhouse gas emissions nature and because we're in a hurry. So this is a particularly important example. This uh, is a w We live in a world where risk and capital markets don't handle risk very well and we can think of ways in which make, making that happen much better. Development banks, I think, are an important part of the story. Feed-in tariffs, which uh, help with the <clears throat> greenhouse gas uh, externality, but they can also help with this story of um, uh, poor handling of risk in the capital markets. Network, this is a, an area pervaded with the importance of networks. Grids, public transport, broadband, recycling, uh, the putting community-based uh, community insulation schemes, all these are areas of networks. Now, networks don't mean you need public ownership, but networks do mean that you need a framework of public policy. Because if you have a network, then my involvement in the network influences your use of the network. It might be congestion, or it might be another way around. You know, if in principle, if you add to the size of a telephone system, then you uh, increase the uh, value of any particular person's telephone. But networks involve these kinds of relationships and they require uh, 
public frameworks, public policy frameworks. This is an area where information is enormously important. And finally, um, uh, the co-benefits. Uh, we must find some other language, but basically uh, there are immense co-benefits from cutting down on the burning of fossil fuels, for example, and particularly around air pollution, where the potential benefits are enormous. Probably killing 4,000 a day in uh, China, killing 30,000 a year in the UK. That's one in 2,000 of our population in the UK every year from uh, air pollution. These are enormous nu numbers. Uh, I think it's 13 of the 25 most polluted cities in terms of PM 2.5 are in uh, India, with uh, Delhi uh, being the worst. Uh, these are huge numbers, millions a year that we're talking about. Now, co-benefit is a kind of flat language. Uh, reducing those kinds of deaths is of enormous importance, and it comes with reducing the burning of uh, fossil fuels. Um, they're not the only source of air pollution, but they're a very important source of um, air pollution. So you can see that when we talk about um, investment and the credibility of policies, it's very important to start getting analytically specific about the kinds of policies that you're going to need. These are six major market failures. I started with the greatest market failure the world has ever seen. You mustn't stop there because uh, these other five that I've described here are extremely important. So it shows the subtlety of public policy in, uh, in this uh, area. Um, and uh, it's actually intellectually as fascinating an area of public policy as you could imagine. Risk, information, behavioral stuff, networks and relationships, it's a very rich analytical story. Now, um, because of the public nature of emissions, the, the concentrations, other concentrations, it doesn't matter whether a kg of a greenhouse gas came from Johannesburg or Beijing or London. Because of the public nature, because of the kinds of policies that are necessary that I've just described, you know, around discovery, around networks and so on, this is very much an area where it, collaboration is needed. And you need collaboration, you need the, uh, everyone involved really, but I've just picked out key elements. The G20 is starting to get more closely involved in climate change. Six or seven years ago, there were those in the G20 that said climate change is for the UNFCCC. That kind of argument is gone. It's moved to uh, centre stage. You've got the, uh, the, um, the BIS, the Bank for International Settlements, the Central Bankers Bank in <coughs> Switzerland, in Zurich, is uh, focused now on the risks associated with climate change. Climate change has started to be at the centre of public economic discussion. That wasn't true five, six years ago. That itself is an important uh, advance. Of course, nations are making their own policies. Businesses, and you're going to hear from the splendid Paul Pullman this afternoon, uh, and uh, Unilever want to go carbon positive in the sense of actually negative emissions, uh, making a positive contribution. Uh, by 2030 and of course they don't just look at their own activities they look right back through their supply chains many other uh, businesses moving in that direction many businesses who have internal carbon prices I discussed that a little bit yesterday so that's a uh, story of strong action in different kinds of places and of course public pressure is a very important part of this uh, story and uh, you know the the schools now are teaching climate change, notwithstanding the odd attempt to mess up their curriculum. The schools are uh, teaching uh, uh, climate change in a very strong way. I had a great friend who told me the future of the world lies in the hands of geography teachers. Are there any geography teachers here? There's one, there's one there. Well, good, you keep at it. Uh, <laughs> so um, I've spoken about the areas of policy, the credibility of policy, but that credibility of policy comes in large measure uh, through the kinds of institutions you have. I haven't got time to discuss them all, but I want to mention at least some of the positive ones. There's the Carbon Prices Leadership Coalition, which I hope will be raising its profile still more strongly and giving uh, understanding, helping giving understanding of 
the level, what levels of carbon prices we should expect, how they should go up over time, how different kinds of approach to carbon pricing can work in different kinds of sectors and uh, contexts. The investment framework, frameworks are very important. This is moving to, to the centre of stage, it, the centre of, centre of the stage in uh, international uh, development banks and so on, and they play a big role in partnership, reducing risk in ways I'll come to in a bit more uh, detail. Mission innovation, getting together across countries, this was part of the Paris uh, Agreement, is, uh, is very important. And very importantly, we've got Mike Bloomberg's task force on climate-related climate financial disclosures uh, reporting at the end of this year. And their financial entities, I mean a, a pension fund or whatever it might be, will have to report on the climate risk in their portfolio. And that's going to be a game changer, I think. So uh, institutions are very important in facilitation and credibility and so on. And we've had some progress there. I'm celebrating progress along as we go and looking forward as to where it might go, always remembering uh, if I move, if I sound a bit optimistic every now and again, uh, everything we're doing is far too slow. I don't want to say that all the time, but uh, please notice that uh, and remember. The cities are a very important part again, and I said a bit about that yesterday, I won't say so much today. But the cities are the big driver of emissions, they're the big driver of infrastructure growth, that's there that pollution is particularly and congestion are particularly intense. It's, it's the cities of the world that, uh, and we've got a session on this coming up afterwards, so I won't develop it, but the, the story is going to be decided in the cities of the world. You have many more mayors of those cities, uh, and Hidalgo was brilliant in Paris in leading uh, the uh, coalitions of uh, cities. It's a very important part of the story. So I've tried to describe, that's the, as it were, the first of the two major chunks of what we have to, what I wanted to say uh, looking forward. I've tried to describe the growth story, what it looks like in a very broad brush way, and the kinds of things you need to do in terms of credibility of policy, policies themselves, institutions, collaborations and so on, to get the framework for that growth story to have a chance of functioning. Cities, of course, centrally placed in all that. Now, in this story, infrastructure, I mean, infrastructure is sort of a soft word that people don't, it doesn't get the blood coursing <laughs> through the veins. You know, I'm terribly interested in infrastructure. You know, people say, oh, oh dear. But the, um, <laughs> it, what we're talking about, you know, is energy, transport, water. You know, the lifeblood of what we do, the, the, things, that, the things that enable everything else. And if you do it badly, you kill people through air pollution, <laughs> poisoned water, road accidents, you kill people, you slow them down, you maim them. That's bad infrastructure, you stop them working. Good infrastructure is, is the opposite, and it is absolutely fundamental to this uh, whole story. So next time somebody tells you they're interested in sustainable infrastructure, give them a big hug, because they're doing something that's really serious. It's, uh, and if you think about where this is, I mean, 60, 65, 70%, you know, you can't do it with great precision, of our uh, emissions arise from infrastructure and its use. If you look forward, probably 70% or more of that infrastructure will be in emerging markets and developing countries. Multiply those two fractions together, you get something close to a half. You know, 0.7 times 0.7 is, is 0.49, right? You get something close to a half of what we have to do being infrastructure in emerging markets and developing countries. Uh, in, in, as we used to say, I'm sure you uh, different forms now, but that is where it's at. That is where this big story is going to play its way through. That's what we should be doing first and foremost. <laughs> There's the other half. Of course, you know, both halves matter. But so uh, where I'll be working particularly intensively is the sustainable infrastructure in emerging market and developing countries. So I hope I've said enough that it's, it's uh, clear, it's central to the story. Uh, some of our colleagues from Oxford, uh, Cameron Hepburn, Pfeiffer and others, have shown uh, through looking at emissions from existing power plants just how narrow our room for manoeuvre is. And uh, really we have to be clear that all infrastructure investment from now on has to be clean and green. There's very little shape, there's very little space for anything uh, else. I don't use the word green much anymore. It all got to be sustainable. You can't have, well, 
35% is green, 65% not green. That's very bad. That's going to put us in uh, real trouble. Where, and, and anyway, what's green and not green? I mean, you've got to look at uh, sustainability from uh, the perspective as a whole. And of course, the definition of sustainability is giving those that come something like some chances which are <coughs> at least as good across the board as the chances you had, assuming they do the same for the next generation. That's the understanding of <coughs> sustainability. Now, um, this, this graph was from my great friend and collaborator, Amara Bhattacharya, looking at the way in which sustainable infrastructure fits with the sustainable development goals. Now, uh, even those of you who are young and with great eyesight won't be able to take in all of that the, uh, and sitting near the front, but the slides are a public good, they're available, I hope they'll go on the website uh, today. But essentially, if you look at the sustainable development goals, um, in the uh, top, on the other side from me, it says supports inclusive growth. In the top, closest to me, it says enhances access to basic services. And at the bottom, promotes environmental sustainability. And if you look at the sustainable development goals, sustainable infrastructure feeds into all those uh, stories. I said in, in the examples I gave at the beginning, I hope enough to uh, illustrate that. But if you think of sustainable infrastructure, you're thinking of everything you're in terms of uh, impacts and sustainable development goals. You're thinking of chances to educate. You're thinking of health. Um, you're thinking of um, environment and uh, so on. And of course, above all, you're thinking of the growth story, the sustainable growth story. So I wanted to just use this diagram to uh, strengthen the point that sustainable infrastructure is at the heart of the whole story of sustainable development. If you look at the sustainable development goals, 12 of them mention explicitly, of the 17, mention explicitly environment, climate or sustainability, with sustainability being the dominant word. And the other five have it <coughs> pretty well, strongly, implicitly in the definitions that they, they use. Um, they, the, the great thing about this global agenda is it applies to everybody. It's not like the Millennium Development Goals applying to developing countries. This applies to everybody, and everybody uh, voted uh, to support it. So um, the challenge now is the next 20 years. You can put this in many different ways, and I won't uh, offer too many, but one way of looking at it is the world economy will roughly double in the next 20 years. 3% growth rate doubles in 23 years. The world economy will roughly double. The infrastructure will more than double because we're moving through this process of urbanization and of uh, countries passing through areas where the income elasticity demand for better transport, better energy, better water is strong. So infrastructure investment will be a, such that the total amount of infrastructure 20 years from now will be well over twice the infrastructure we have now. So you can see very clearly from that, that defines our challenge. Will that new world, or bigger than new world, we build over the next 20 years in terms of economy and infrastructure, will that be sustainable or will it not? If it's not, and we, we're back to, or stay with, and make worse cities where we can't move and breathe and be productive, uh, we will have completely wiped out any chance of two degrees, um, or do it well, and we're embarked on a much more attractive uh, way of living and growth story. Um, probably 80, 90 trillion dollars in infrastructure will come over the next 15. Whichever way you look at it, this next 15 or 20 years is absolutely decisive in whether we manage on climate change and what kind of way of living and working and developing and including and reducing poverty we can find, whether we can find those uh, routes. You can look at it in the pace of urbanization. Our cities are going to go from 3.5 billion now to 6.5 billion, roughly speaking. Decimal points don't matter too much uh, in this context in the next uh, 35 or 40 years. They'll be shaped in the next 20. So this next 20 years and the investments we make in the next 20 years are critical. You can't wait till year 19 and do all your investments. I mean, this is going to be shaped by the policies and actions we put in place in the next 10 years. I've already argued that more of, most of that will be in the emerging markets and uh, developing countries. Uh, we should note and underline 
that a lot of the more sustainable investments um, don't cost more, indeed many of them cost less over their lifetime than the alternatives, even without good pricing. But a lot of them do involve capital up front. They're capital intensive because the capital up front removes the need for a lot of the running costs, for example, buying the fuel down the track. So the more we can manage risk of those investments, the more we can bring down the cost of capital. It's absolutely fundamental. The more we can bring down the cost of capital, the better our chance of not only on the scale of investment, but also tilting them towards the kind of sustainability that we're going to need. If you cut the cost of capital from 8 or 9% real to 3% real, you dramatically transform any cost comparison between a renewable and something else. It's a huge change in any kind of cost comparison. Of course, on top of that, you need proper pricing for emissions as well, and you really turn the tables on the way in which, uh, uh, the, on the profitability and the attractiveness for the investor of the kinds of investments that we're going to need. This um, is from the Global Commission on the Economy and Climate. We just published um, the rep a report last uh, month uh, on um, the sustainable infrastructure imperative, looking in some detail at the kinds of investments that uh, we have to make. I've been collaborating with Amar Bhattacharya on the work which underpinned uh, that report. In the slide, uh, all the references you need are on the back of the slide pack that uh, you can access uh, today. Now, I spent 10 years of my life as a uh, chief, chief economist of either the EBRD or of the World Bank, um, two-thirds former, one-third latter of that decade. And um, I think, uh, I'm, I hope I'm influenced by that experience. Uh, the risk-carrying capacity, the risk-changing capacity that these banks can bring to the table can be absolutely fundamental. Uh, infrastructure in its early stages is risky and difficult. You need mechanisms, you need partners, you need institutions to reduce and carry that risk. At the EBRD, we had, uh, we had firms which were so large that they could have bought the EBRD easily. They wanted the EBRD, I'm talking about the 1990s now, we wanted the EB, they wanted the EBRD as a partner because it objectively reduced the risk. It objectively reduced government-induced poverty, uh, policy risk. Yeah? That is a big part of the story. You get great skills developing in these investment banks. Josue Tanaka is just here. They have, uh, over the years, from the EBRD, over the years they've built, is it more than 20, how much now, more than 20 billion now? 21 billion. 21 billion in uh, clean, particularly energy efficiency investments. Those are real skills. If you want to know how to invest in energy efficiency, take Josue's card and get, seek out his advice. And if, if you're eligible, seek out the EBRD's money. Uh, this is a way of objectively reducing risk, getting access to skills. They have convening power. Is there anyone here from Goldman Sachs? No. Well, look, if Goldman Sachs ring you up and say, um, hey, Fred, not Fred Goodwin, somebody else. Hey, um, <laughs> hey, Fred, I've got this wonderful idea for a new investment. All you have to do, you have to do anything. You relax. You know, you go and play golf. Uh, I'll look after the money. It'll all be fine. Well, I mean, you'd, you'd start sort of button up your jacket and put your hand on your wallet. And, um, but if... You know, if a development bank says, actually, we've been doing a lot of work in this area, we've got a few partners already, do you want to come and talk about this? Well, people will do it. It's, 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 it's being a trusted convener. And that is a very important... So there's a whole string of reasons why a multilateral development bank or a green investment bank, for example, as we have in the UK, and I hope it stays a green investment bank through the process of privatisation. We live in hope. And uh, this is a story, then, of... Uh, a very powerful role in handling risk and reducing risk that that kind of partner can bring to the table. If you get over the initial stages with that kind of support, then there's a whole wall of money, trillions of it, in uh, financial institutions that can come in afterwards where you can sell on that story. <coughs> if you've done it well, you sell on at a profit. But those kinds of financial institutions can't come in 
they're institutionally really constrained for good reason because they're looking after pension money. They can't come in and take the kind of early stage risk that we're talking about here. But they can buy out and they can participate down the track. And that should be very attractive. So instead of putting their money into oil companies for a long-term future for their pensioners, which is now an extremely risky, uh, as well as a dodgy, it's an extremely risky uh, strategy to follow. The, um, um, you have now a picture of a possibility of these long-term sustainable infrastructure investments if they get off the ground well as being very attractive to the institutional in, uh, investors. In order to do this, the uh, multilateral development banks are going to have to expand. Uh, they should be lending for infrastructure not 30 to 40 billion a year, but something like 200 billion. If that 200 billion starts to kick in, you often have multipliers of three or four uh, in terms of the link between the lending and the finance of the multilateral institution and the overall size of the project. You can have, if, you, if this is a project with very powerful examples, there'll be other multipliers through the kinds of opportunities and demonstration that these projects have brought. So you can see, if you can move up from 30 or 40 billion a year infrastructure lending to more like 200, then you start to be getting to the trillions that you need. We can do this. This isn't that hard. You can do this by very modest expansions of the capital, very modest expansions of the capital in those multilateral development banks and some adjustments in the gearing ratio. I was very involved with one or two others, Amara and Joe Stiglitz, in helping with the birth of the new development bank, the BRICS Bank. I'm on the International Advisory Panel, which met uh, last week in Beijing for the first time, of the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank. These new banks are coming to the table. It's possible here to really do what I'm describing, to increase that lending power from 30 or 40 billion a year to 200 billion a year. Um, it, most of you will be not involved in the details of the financial arrangements of these banks, but there's a thing called the gearing ratio, which is how much they're allowed to lend against the capital that they have. And at the moment, that's extremely conservative. And if the bank's cap capitalized at 100 billion, then their total portfolio can't be more than 100 billion. Well, that's extremely conservative. With the right track record, you can expand that gearing ratio to 1.5 or 2. We really know how to do this, and it's really small beer in terms of subscriptions from the shareholders, but it could have an enormous effect through the multipliers I've uh, just uh, described. So we know how, we've seen how these banks can run well. Uh, we've seen the expansion of them through the AIIB and the New Development Bank. We can see how to increase their capacity to finance. So I, it's not only that they can be at the center stage, they can be at center stage on the magnitude we need with pretty modest injections of uh, capital. So let me finish with what might happen next. Well, this is a diagram just reminding us as, as we start to conclude, we really are in a hurry. Um, the brown it's deliberately a nasty brown color, uh, is uh, something like where we have been headed. And uh, the blue is something like where we um, have to be to have any chance of holding to two degrees. We have to change from the brown corridor to the blue corridor, and we have to do that quickly. Otherwise, uh, we simply can't catch up. There's a corridor that simply encapsulates that you can do a bit more earlier and a bit less later, or a bit less earlier and a bit more later. But that's the sort of corridor it is. You can't bump along the top of this corridor. That's a contradiction. Yeah? It's, uh, if you do more later, you can do less now. But if you start off at the top of the corridor, you've got to be down the bottom of the corridor later on. So you can see that that blue one uh, cuts uh, the zero axis. Exactly where, we're not uh, sure, but sometime around 2080 or so, we have to uh, be net zero. Um, the, uh, that 
diagram and, and the other ways I put it earlier in the lecture underline the criticality of these next 20 years. And of course, if we have to do all that in the next 20 years, we have to move quickly in the next 10 to get the policies in place. The prizes, I've already really set them out uh, through the course of the lecture. The prizes that we get in terms of the kind of cities that uh, we have, the characteristics of the energy systems that we need, the policies that we have to set in place have um, been something I've been trying to describe throughout. And we would have food systems that were much more efficient and resilient and so on. So the prizes that we get for doing this are surely uh, enormously uh, attractive. Um, we have to act, because it's on such scale and because it's everywhere, we have to act not only very quickly, but also across the board. It's quite remarkable in discussions of um, sustainability and green and so on that people jump immediately to the power sector, electricity. The power sector is extremely important, but in India it's less than 20% of energy in emissions. Other places it might be 23, 24, 25%. It matters, it's big, it's important. But what about the other 75 or 80%? It's not simply acting quickly, it's acting everywhere. And so uh, heating, transport, industry is vital, as uh, Fatih emphasised so clearly and strongly, energy efficiency, but not just energy efficiency, resource efficiency and recycling and so on are of fundamental uh, importance. Building buildings so that they can be dismantled and that steel is not encased in concrete, which takes you forever to get uh, off. Dismantle in a way that you can recycle, but design that way in from the beginning. All this is of fundamental importance. So power sector matters. As we electrify transport, it might move up, and other things, it might move up from 25% to 45%, but there's still a very big story elsewhere. Negative emissions, well, I've already emphasised the importance. How do you do negative emissions? Well, in the medium term, the short and medium term, growing and intensifying forest cover and uh, rehabilitation of degraded land and soil capture are very important. But of course, in the longer term, in when you're stabilising, um, you can't go on doing that. I mean, you don't want to ever go backwards, but essentially if your forests are stabilised, uh, then they're not, then cutting down is not emitting. Whilst they're growing up and intensifying, they're capturing, but then they go into steady state. So in the longer term, negative emissions look like uh, bioenergy with CCS, carbon capture and storage. The scope for that may not be very big. We have to look, we have to find out, we have to research, but it may not be very big. There's some wonderful people. There's this great guy called Klaus Lackner who now used to be at Columbia, now in Texas somewhere. He has, imagine, a wonderful vacuum cleaner for uh, sucking the CO2 out of the atmosphere and turning it into, I don't know, building material. I mean, maybe, <laughs> maybe. Uh, we wish him luck. Um, but as we think about it, how to do it, in the longer term, in steady state, it's hard to imagine this being on a very big scale. So it's very important. And the reforestation, the intensification of the forest, very important in the shorter uh, run. And the shorter run, I mean by the next 20, 30, 40 years. That can help enormously. That will pull out of the atmosphere. But the steady state stories are much more uh, limited. So how are we going to get there? We have to make the argument this is very attractive. We have to build the political will. And that will come from public pressure, understanding, the power of the example, but it will require a great deal of leadership in politics, business, and civil society. You'll see some of the leaders later on today. So this is the last slide. I am, we can make this a century where we actually tackle the two defining challenges of our time, overcoming poverty and managing climate change. If we fail on one, we will fail on the other. We can, make it, we can really make it the best of centuries, but it could be the worst. It could be the century where we decisively destroy or undermine the possibilities for the people who come after us in the ways that I've described. I'm enormously optimistic about what we can do. It's both feasible and attractive. I worry, I really worry about whether we will. I think 
to understand what we can do, to describe it, to show what policy is involved, to show what investments are involved, to show what finance is involved, is a fundamental necessary condition. You can't move towards the feasible without analysing and describing and giving examples and showing that it's very attractive. But will it be sufficient? Will showing what we can do and showing how attractive it is, bringing the examples on, will it be sufficient? I honestly don't know. I'm enormously optimistic about what we can do. I do worry quite a lot about whether we will. So thank you very much indeed. So we have uh, five, ten minutes to take uh, a few questions. Uh, I'll take them in a group of two or three, and uh, I do encourage you to ask a question as opposed to uh, making a, a speech. So we'll start with the gentleman down front on the right. Do you have microphones? You do. Could you tell us who you are before you pose sure, your question? Mark, Mark Partington. Uh, questions about uh, China. It looks as if uh, they're going to over-allocate to their emissions trading scheme, the national scheme, starting next year, and hence you know, the same thing that the EU did which will mean that coal won't really be pushed off the grid until at least 2026. Um, do you have any comments, please? Thank you. So a question from further back. Yeah, I've got a gentleman in the middle here with the, wearing the tie. That's it. Thank you. I was wondering, <coughs> speaking of good policy, how tell us, Tell us who you are. My name is Mika Korya. I work for, green, I'm a green bonds analyst and just finished my master's at, at LSE. Um, my question was, Speaking of good policy, how could the UK, for example, push for more green bonds issues without deterring uh, green bonds issues with too much regulation? Thank you. Okay, and we'll take one more and then we'll go back to uh, Nick. Okay, we've got a gentleman down at the front here, please, Patrick. Yeah, speaking of the Pollution Tax Association, I was just interested in the graph of the uh, carbon emissions coming down. Uh, and I wonder what science is behind that. I've done a few calculations, and so following carbon brief, basically, on the remaining carbon budget, and it doesn't seem to last very long, doesn't seem to last as lo long as you suggest, without enormous rates of decarbonisation that are, are unbelievable, uh, left with the possibility, the necessi necessity of degrowth, you know, stop flying, stop building with bricks and steel and eating beef. Okay, thank you. So we've got three questions there for you, Nick. Yeah. Uh, China, um, the, the, the dominant framework in China uh, would be the 13th five-year plan and the 14th five-year plan to follow. Those go into law uh, and uh, they are the criteria against which the uh, Chinese leadership asks to be judged. So um, the emissions trading scheme is a method. So I would look and start to look at the objectives and on the whole, uh, Chinese plans are credible. So my feeling is they'll learn by doing in the emissions trading scheme. If it doesn't, it's not consistent with the kind of results that they're seeking, then they'll either adjust it or look to some other way. They're very, very serious about the targets. It looks as if coal, and this is a piece that Fergus Green and I published uh, a year or so ago, it looks as if uh, um, China peaked coal uh, a couple of years ago. It might be flat for a while, bounce around, but our guess is it will start to turn down about uh, 2020, partly because of the commitment from the China, and I've been working in China for nearly 30 years now and seen the remarkable change, and including on talking about the plans. Uh, the commitment uh, is remarkably deep for very good reasons, worry about climate change, worry about uh, uh, pollution, uh, and uh, seeing the great opportunities that are there in the new technologies, recognizing how big China is in, in the world and how it influences others. For all those reasons, I think that Chinese commitment is deep and strong. So I would look to that and the targets. Uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, the target that they gave of, um, in uh, Paris of um, reducing, what was it, about 65% uh, emissions per unit of output, 2005 to 2030, they will meet. They said they'd peak the emissions absolutely by 2030. My guess is they'll do that by the mid, sorry, the mid to early, perhaps early 20s. 
So because of what they're doing, because of their commitment, because of the reasons underlining, underlying that commitment, I'm convinced that China, which has become a leader, will remain the leader on this. And if they run into problems like oversupplying on the ETS, uh, they'll react quickly and uh, either find some other way or sort it, sort it out. On green bonds, um, it's not something where I've done a great deal of work myself. Um, there was a lot of work with the, um, in for this uh, G20 between the uh, government of China and the Bank of England. Uh, um, Andy Haldane uh, was involved, Ma Jun from China, uh, Chinese Central Bank. So I think there's quite a lot of ideas. My own view is that if you want to issue a green bond, you can issue uh, a green bond. It essentially involves a promise to use the proceeds for wise, good, decent, green investment. And that's what makes it a green bond. I mean, it's not the color of the paper, right? So, um, the, so on the whole is, can you trust people to do that? And uh, basically, it's tra I, don't, I think overly heavy regulation would probably be a difficulty. I mean, it's transparency that, uh, that, that really counts, in, uh, in my view, uh, on this. Now, on the paths that give you two degrees, um, those are basically taken from um, scientific work of others, whether it's IPCC, people like Miles Allen, groups in... Uh, no, it's taken, it's taken from a body of work, but basically the first point of uh, access is I IPCC. That's oh, basically... Well, Yeah, the models, yeah, this is an area with lots of, uh, and I spoke about tipping points and feedbacks when I was speaking. Um, and Brian, is Brian here, Brian Hoskins? He, he's my great guru on uh, these things, and he's the person at the Royal Society who looks after those sorts of things. You may have people you like or dislike. I mean, uh, I am talking about the literature, what the Royal Society brings to the table, what the IPCC brings to the table. But before you interrupt it, I was about to say what Brian says is that uh, climate models are what we get if we're lucky, yeah? because they leave out things which uh, are risky. So I prefer to go to the Brian's of the world who leads for the uh, Royal Society on this, ask him what looks sensible, ask him what the literature offers. Same with the uh, IPCC, offer those up, but uh, I also often offer the Brian Hoskins warning, which is uh, that these models describe what happens if we're lucky. There are all kinds of risks in there that they're not sure that they can model very well, and the good ones uh, tell you what they uh, tell you what they are. Um, Thanks, Nick. Then, ladies and gentlemen, I'm afraid I'll have to bring this session to a close now. Uh, I know that one or two of you have questions, but there'll be time in the coffee break uh, to discuss those. So uh, we've got. Tea and coffee and refreshments in the adjacent rooms. Uh, and I think we reconvene again in half an hour at 10.45. I'm looking for someone to scream at me if that's incorrect. Good. Uh, just please join me once again in thanking Nick, and then let's get coffee.